Um, hi guys, can yeah. everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. So, um, good afternoon, guys. Uh, today we're gonna do a little revision for the pregnancy chapter. Okay, so um, I, I assume maybe most of you have probably studied that so far, but so this is going to be a really good revision for you guys. So, um, one sec, guys. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so, first thing you need to know is that during pregnancy, we have two periods, okay? We have the embryonic period, uh, which lasts about approximately from fertilization till week eight. We call um, the conceptus an, an embryo. And then after the eighth week, from week nine until birth, we call this the fetal period, okay? Those are two periods that you need to be familiar with. And when we, so that when I say embryo, you know we're talking um, up until week eight. And then when I say um, uh, fetus, uh, we're talking from week nine up until birth, okay? So, um, okay. So I guess you're all familiar with the term fertilization. Um, fertilization is basically when the sperm and the egg, they meet and they fuse. What fuses exactly? They're genetic material, they're chromosomes, okay? They combine and we get the fertilized egg, which we call a zygote, all right? So, um, for successful fertilization to occur, uh, we we say that the, that intercourse must not occur, must occur no more than two days before ovulation. What does this mean? So basically, ovulation is when the egg is available to be fertilized, and this is not all the time. Not after every intercourse, there's a chan chance of pregnancy. Um, the female has to be ovulating. The egg has to be ready. It has to be in uh, the uterine tube, uh, just waiting for the sperm. So when ovulation occurs, we can have a chance of pregnancy, uh, but intercourse should be like two days before or 24 hours after because the egg is not gonna stay vi uh, viable for like the entire time, okay? So next, we're gonna talk about the sperm transport. Basically, um, when the male ejaculates, okay, they release millions of sperm, so much, so much sperm, but how does, but not all of them end up reaching the uterus. We don't get all the millions of sperm and they all reach the egg. They all fertilize the egg. That's not how it works. Basically, what happens is that only a few thousands end up reaching the uterus. So how does the number go from millions to a few thousands? Well, sperm face so many obstacles when they're um, going, when they're trying to reach the egg. First, we're going to lose a lot of like millions and millions of sperm. They're just going to leak from the vagina. They're just going to not even enter. That's it. They just leave for like they're in there for like a split second and then they leak out. So that's the first obstacle. The ones that actually do stay in the vagina, they're destroyed by acidity because the um, vagina's environment is very acidic and it's basically just it's going to destroy the sperm because sperm, they don't like um, acidic environments. So that's the second obstacle. Now, the ones that actually survive this are just a couple of thousands and they will manage to reach the uterus. But does that mean that's it? They're gonna um, fertilize the egg? No, they're also gonna be killed by uh, uterine contractions. And if they do survive that, then they're gonna be destroyed by phag phagocytes, cells that will engulf them and just destroy them, okay? So sperm, it takes a lot for sperm to actually reach the egg. Is uh, that clear for everyone? Is everyone familiar with all of these? Yes. Perfect. <clears throat> so now let's say that the sperm has reached the egg. Does that mean that it can fertilize it directly? No. Um, it has to undergo a process that we call capacitation. Now, why do we need capacitation to happen? Basically, capacitation enhances sperm motility. It makes it move faster and it makes it just reach the egg um, at a more efficient rate. And another thing, a very, very important reason why we need capacitation is to loosen the membrane of the sperm. Why? Basically, sperm contains enzymes that we call hydrolytic enzymes. Now, these enzymes, they're, they destroy everything that comes in their way. They're, they damage everything. So the membrane, the sperm membrane, it's gonna, it has to be tough so that it can protect the male from these enzymes. So when the sperm is inside the male, okay, it has to be, it has to have a strong membrane that these enzymes will not be released. But when it goes into the female, do we still need that strong membrane? No, why? Because the goal of the sperm is to penetrate the egg, it's to go through it. So we do need these enzymes 
to actually penetrate and go through all of the membranes that are found and that cover the egg, okay? So this is why capacitation is very important because if the sperm ends up reaching the egg it's, and it's, it has not undergone capacitation, then there's going to be no use. Nothing's going to happen because we won't have anything that's going to help the sperm actually poke through the egg. So how does capacitation actually happen? Basically, there are a couple of secretions, a couple of liquids and uh, just sort all sorts of um, materials that are secreted from the female tract and they remove the membrane proteins that are found on the uh, on the sperm. These proteins and like some cholesterol molecules, they keep the sperm membrane stable. They keep it strong. So when we remove these proteins, the sperm is actually, the membrane is actually going to get weaker and the enzymes can be released at a much easier uh, rate, okay, at a much faster rate. Can um, I ask a question? Uh, can you hear me? If whoever has a question, go ahead. Um, so are the um the acrosome the acrosoma like um like the enzymes aren't they in the sperm itself? Yes, yes, they are in the sperm. Uh, so what we're saying here is that these enzymes they're in the sperm and they're surrounded by a membrane, a membrane that's going to keep that, that's going to keep them inside the sperm. But when the sperm en enters the uterus and it wants to penetrate the egg, we have to loosen the membrane so that these enzymes can be released. We want them to be released. Is that clear? So they are in the in the sperm but we don't want them to stay there. And you'll see why in a second. We want them to actually penetrate the egg. We want them to go through the egg. You get that? Yes, thank you. Okay, so now the sperm have uh, undergone capacitation. They are ready to uh, reach the egg. How do they actually find their way to the egg? You can think of them as some sort of you can say like dogs that are sensing a smell that uh, they follow a scent. So that's what's happening. Basically, sperms, they have um, receptors that help them and they guide them because they sense certain chemicals that are released by the egg. So they're going to sense these chemicals and they're going to follow the track. They're going to follow the track and sense where the egg is. And that's how they're going to end up reaching it. You can see in this picture right here, they're sensing all of the uh the direction of the fluid flow, uh, the temperature, the chemicals that the egg is releasing, and they're just going to follow the scent and actually uh, reach the egg. Okay, so here, okay, let's let's take a look at um, the egg itself. Okay, the egg is not just one cell that's just on its own undefended. It has certain layers that cover it and protect it. We have the, the outer layer, which we call the corona radiata. It's this layer of cells. You can see it's a very thick layer. And then underneath that, we have the zona pellucida. The zona pellucida is another membrane that covers the uh, eggs. Okay. And then after that, yellow, you can see like the plasma membrane. Okay. So that's why we said we need the enzymes. We want to go through all of these layers to actually reach the egg. Okay. So is everything clear until now so that we can start talking about the acrosomal reactions? Yes. Yeah, that's great. Yes. Perfect. So what is the acrosomal reaction? Let's see. So here we can see that the sperm, they're swimming towards the egg. This over here, this is the cell membrane of the egg. You can see these uh, little purple um, kind of arrows. These are the receptors of the actual um, egg. Then we can see this thick blue layer. This is the zona pellucida. And this right here, this group of cells, this is the corona radiata. So the um the sperm they're gonna be uh, guided and they're gonna reach the uh, they're gonna reach the egg and they're gonna start penetrating layer by layer they're gonna start ripping out or digesting layer by layer the first one is the corona radiata after they after they uh, pass that layer they're gonna go into the zona pellucida this is where we said we need the enzymes because you saw we have a lot of layers and it's gonna be hard for the sperm to penetrate them alone so it's gonna need the help the help of these enzymes okay so once the you can see these little golden dots these are the cell receptors that these are the receptors that we find on the zona pellucida so when the sperm is going to bind to the receptors we're going to have an increase in calcium levels inside okay so when the levels of calcium increase inside the sperm they're going to trigger the release of these enzymes so we said 
that during capacitation, we weaken the membrane and the enzymes are ready to be released. They're not going to be released on their own. They're going to wait until the sperm binds to the zona pellucida, the calcium levels will rise, and then they're going to be released. So once they release, they're going to digest and just eat out the zona uh, pellucida, and uh, they're going to try and reach the cell membrane of the uh, egg or, or the oocyte. Okay? So they bit through, they're going in, they reach the cell membrane. You can see now they're going to do what? They're going to bind to the uh, receptors. These are special receptors that are just, for, they're waiting for the sperm to bind to them, okay? So when that happens, there we have the sperm has officially met the egg. It passed all of the layers. It passed all of its obstacles. This is their first encounterment, their first interaction. What is going to happen next? We're going to have fusion. Fusion is, this is where fertilization is going to happen. We said they're going to have to fuse. Do you think that all of the sperm is going to go inside the egg? No. No, only one. No. We're not, we're not even going to have the entire the entire structure of the sperm, just the material that we find inside, specifically the nucleus, because we want the DNA that's inside the cell. So once the the first sperm that ends up reaching and binding to the uh, to the egg, once the first sperm binds, that's it, only one, we're going to have something called block to polyspermy. Now, what is polyspermy? Okay, let's talk about that. So polyspermy is when we have more than one sperm into in going inside an egg. Do we want that to happen? No. Why do we need so many genetic material coming from the male? We only need one copy from the female and one copy from the male. So once one sperm binds, okay, we have two mechanisms that happen to ensure that no other sperm can bind to the uh, to the egg. The first one is going to be the oocyte membrane block. What is going to happen when one sperm, you can see here, it's uh, it's binded to a receptor. The other receptors, if you notice here, they're just, they're going away. They're flying away. They're going to be released so that no more receptors, no more sperm can bind to these receptors. This is the first mechanism, okay? So receptors are gone, so the sperm cannot bind to anything, and they're going to swim away. The second reaction is the cortical reaction. Basically, when the sperm is going to bind to the egg, we're going to have granules that will be released, that they're, they're going to be released into the zona pellucida, and they're going to make it tough. They're going to make it really strong so that no sperm can bind to it, even with all the acrosomal enzymes and all of the uh, help it's getting to try and digest the zona pellucida, it's not going to happen because it, it, it became such a tough layer. Okay, so those two mechanisms, they ensure that we have monospermy, only one sperm. And that's, um, that's it for the fertilization part. Okay, so like I said, these are the uh, three. Yes, uh, Fatma, you have a question? Um, yes, there is a question that I found in test banks, but I found different answers for it. It is the result for uh, polyspermy in humans. There is two answers, interruption of meiosis and uh, non-functional zygote, which is the correct answer? What's the question exactly? A result of polyspermy in humans. And... Interruption of meiosis uh, or non-functional zygote. Functional zygote. You're not going to have the cell is going to die because there's no it's not possible to have more than one. So it's not going to be functional and it's just going to die at the end. OK, thank you. So those are the three phases of uh, fertilization. The first part, we need to penetrate the corona radiata. After that, you reach the zona pellucida and then you get the fusion where they actually meet the sperm and the uh, and the oocyte. OK. So now we're going to talk about what happens inside the oocyte. So we said that the genetic material of the sperm, it entered inside and is, okay, so since it entered inside and it penetrated, okay, what's going to happen here? Basically, the egg, now you need to know that when the egg is released from the ovary, it's not, it's not fully mature. It's not, it has not completed all of the cell divisions. It's not, it's not ready yet. It's stuck in a process that we call meiosis too. You guys are familiar with meiosis, right? Okay. I think you guys are, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 So 
need to know that when the egg was released from the ovary, it has not completed meiosis two. It's still, it's in the middle of it. So when is it actually going to complete it? When the sperm enters. So basically we said we're going to have the cortical reaction and we're going to have increase in calcium levels. We mentioned all of these. So when we have an increase in calcium levels, we're also going to have an increase in zinc. So when these two happen, when we have more zinc and we have a lot of calcium, the egg is going to end up completing meiosis two, and we're going to have the nucleus and it's going to form uh, the nucleus and the second polar body. Now, the second polar body is just you don't really need to worry about it because it's going to end up dying in the end. OK, so you need to now the egg is completely close. It's mature and it's just um, it's waiting for the sperm genetic material to combine so that we can actually uh, form the first zygote. OK, so. Now the sperm, once it enters, it's going to, the nucleus is going to increase its in size and we're gonna have a pronuclei. A pronuclei, it's, it's before the actual nucleus. It's still growing, it's still developing, okay? And it's gonna, it's gonna form both the egg and the sperm, they're going to form the pronuclei, okay? Those are the first two steps. Now, after that has happened, okay, the pronuclei, they're gonna start replicating their DNA. They're gonna start increasing the number of chromosomes and they're also, and then we're gonna have in here, you can see steps of mitosis. The cell is getting ready to go through um, mitosis. <coughs> Sorry guys, I'm a little bit sick. <coughs> Anyways, so uh, the pronuclei membrane, they're gonna rupture. And what do we have inside the nucleus? We have the chromosomes, okay? So the chromosomes are actually gonna end up being released and they're going to combine. And, so, and once the chromosomes combine, this is what we call fertilization. It's now accomplished. Sorry, anyways, so this is, so when you wanted to find fertilization, it's basically when the oocyte is being penetrated by the sperm and it's uh, the genetic material is being combined, both from uh, the male and the female. Because <coughs> for us to have a complete cell, we're gonna need 46 chromosomes, is that correct? And the egg only has 23 and the sperm only has 23. So when they combine, we form our first complete cell. Is that um, clear so far? Yes. yes. Um, why is it called a secondary oocyte? Like, why is like the secondary there? This is uh, you're gonna learn this inshallah in year one because basically inside you don't have to worry about this now, but basically inside the ovary, uh, the in the process of actually making the egg. We're going to have something called a primary oocyte and then another couple of steps, and then it's going to release, be released as a secondary oocyte. But you don't have to worry about this now. Worry about it, inshallah, in year one. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, sorry, yes, go ahead. Like in zonal pilosoda, more than one sperm can penetrate that membrane, but one sperm can enter the oocyte itself? You can think of it as a race. Whichever sperm penet penetrates it the quickest and reaches this, the membrane of the oocyte and binds to it, that's going to be the sperm. That's it. And all of them are going to be uh, released later on and just guided away from the egg. We're going to have the blocked polyspermy. So there's many sperms in the um, zona pellucida membrane. They're gonna, yes, many are going to try to penetrate it, but whoever reaches quickest and actually binds to the receptor, that's going to be the sperm and all of the other ones. We said that the receptors are going to be released and no more can bind. That's it. Thank you. Okay, so now we have our fertilized egg. We have the zygote, okay? So we're going to start with the embryonic development. This fertilized egg is going to form the baby. So at the beginning, we have the first step in embryonic development, which is cleavage. Cleavage is basically, you can think of the word, like if you think of the verb to cleave, to cleave is to divide, to cut, basically. So that's what's going to happen. Here we're going to have a period of rapid mitotic divisions. We're going to just, the cells are just going to divide more and more. And they're going to produce small cells with a high surface to volume ratio. Why do we want a high surface to volume ratio? Can anyone tell me? 
does anyone know or do you want me? Okay. All right. So basically having, having a high surface to volume ratio means that there's less space. Okay. And we know that basically the, the egg is going to need nutrition, right? It's going to be, it's going to need nutrients that it's going to get from the uterus. So if we have high surface to volume ratio, if we have a small space, the nutrients are going to get to the, uh, to the embryo or like to the uh, zygote at a much quicker rate because there's less space for it to travel through and go and reach all of the cells. So when we have a high surface to volume ratio, the delivery of the nutrients for all of the cells is going to be more efficient. It's going to be better and quicker. So we're going to have a well-nourished uh, zygote, okay? So now we go um, and we look at the first cleavage that happens. When does it happen? It happens around 36 hours after fertilization, where we produce two identical cells, okay? So that's the first mitotic division. We know that the result of mitosis are two identical cells, and we're going to call them blastomeres. Okay? So at this stage, we call them blastomeres, okay? And now they're going to continue dividing. After two days or like 48 hours, we're going to have four cells. And after three days or 72 hours, we're going to have a lot of cells that in this structure is what we call the morula, okay? Now, the morula is basically um, just a solid ball of cells. We're going to have so many cells inside, okay? Wait, I think if I have it in the next slide. Um, yeah, okay. One second, okay? So after the morula, we're going to see, do you see what happens here? We're gonna, we have a cavity formed. Let's look at this closer. Let's take a closer look at this, okay? So after four to five days, we have an embryo that consists about 100 cells, okay? We have so many cells at this stage, okay? And we're going to notice that the zona pellucida, it's degenerating. It's starting to disappear. We don't need it anymore. It's going to release the cell. And once the zona pellucida is gone, we call this a blastocyst. Also, another reason why the name changes here is that you can notice that there's fluid forming inside. Now, where is this fluid coming from? This fluid is coming from the uterine cavity. This cavity right here, it's full of fluid and the fluid is going inside. And what's happening is that it's pushing the cells to the side to form a cavity. So this cavity, once it's formed, we call the cell the blastocyst because it contains the blastocyst cavity. Okay. So the so now if you look at the definition, it's a fluid-filled hollow sphere composed of a single layer of large flattened cells. Now, let's take a look at this. We can see that there is an outer circle of cells, right? And then we can see a group of circles inside here. They're just clustered together. So they're kind of divided into like two different layers. The one on the outside, it's we call it the outer cell mass. It's it's kind of forming the border. And this is what we call the trophoblasts, okay? So the trophoblasts are the outer cell mass. We find them uh, like around the border. And then on the inside right here, the inner cell mass, we call them embryoblasts, okay? So here the names are gonna start you know, increasing. So we're going to have so many names, but don't worry. They're just the same thing. But once you move on, the names start to change. So at this point, we have cells covering the border. We call it trophoblast. We have a cavity inside. We call the blastocyst cavity. And we have a cluster of cells, a group of cells that are just stacked together. And we call them the embryoblasts. Is that clear so far? Yes. Okay. Uh, you guys can, yes, uh, Abdurrahman, you have a question? Yes, the two previous slides, I have a yes. question. Yeah, this two identical cells, you mean two zygote? It's no, it's the zygote itself has divided into they don't have names. It's just it's a parent cell. The zygote is the parent cell and it divided to two identical cells. We're just dividing continuously and forming more and more cells. It's the same. The, the parent cell is the zygote, but it just keeps dividing more and more until it, for, it forms all of these cells. Okay. Is that Yes. Thank is there you. any other question? Okay. So, okay. Now, the embryo continues moving. Like, if you look at this picture, we started over here. It was fertilized. It continues moving through the uterine tube, okay? And then it continues until it reaches this site over here. This site of the uterus is where the embryo is going to get implanted. 
okay, inside the endometrium. The endometrium is this part of the uterus. It's this big muscle right here, okay? So it's going to keep moving down until it reaches the appropriate site for it to actually stick and implant itself. Let's talk about implantation. Now, throughout this entire journey, as the uh, the uh, cell, the I mean, the zygote has been moving, the blastocyst, it's been nourished by uterine secretions. We said that the uterus has a lot of fluids, it has a lot of secretions, and those uh, they're glycoprotein rich. They're rich in glycoproteins, and they basically nourish the. Um, the uh, blastocyst and they're giving it its nutrients. And you might get a question like this. It might say uterine milk as an option. It's the same thing, uterine milk or uterine secretions, okay? So um, then this is at day four. It continues to float. And like we said, it's gonna hatch from the zona pellucida. It's gonna just uh, degenerate. The zona pellucida is gonna just disappear, okay? Now, next, it's going to find an appropriate spot in the uterus and it's going to adhere to it. It's going to stick to it. Okay. So basically, once this happens, once the um, the blastocyst is touching or it's it's in contact with the uterus, the endometrium it's going to start to thicken and it's going to take on characteristics of acute inflammation. Now, when we get if we look at acute inflammation. When let's say we're sick and we have inflammation going on in our body, what are we going to have? We're going to have a lot of, we're going to see redness, right? We're going to see a lot of like swelling and redness. And that's what's going to happen here. The redness you're going to see later in, in other pictures is that the blood vessels inside the endometrium, they're going to become leaky. They're going to start leaking blood. And you're going to see why this is important, uh, basically. So again, just to summarize the slide, the blastocyst is going to adhere to the wall of the uterus. It's going to come in contact with it. And once that happens, the uterus is going to start uh, taking on characteristics of acute inflammation. Blood vessels are going to become more leaky. Okay, is this clear? Yes. Now, in implantation, okay, we have, we said that we have here the outer cell layer, this one right here, we call it the trophoblasts. Now, if you take a look at this picture right here, the trophoblasts are the ones that are actually going inside. They're the ones that are trying to penetrate the uterus and actually go inside of it. So, during like when this is going to happen, we're going to notice that the trophoblast it's going to divide into even another into like another two layers. One we call the cytotrophoblast, which is going to be on the inside, and the syncytiotrophoblast, which is going to be on the outside. If you look at this picture right here, those are the trophoblast cells. Right here, the uh, outer cell mass of the trophoblast. Um, yani you're going to see. This part, this dark green part, this is the syncytiotrophoblast. And then on the inside, like just below it, we're going to have the cytotrophoblasts, okay? So the syncytiotrophoblasts are the ones that are going to kind of like just penetrate through the um, endometrium, through the uterus. They're going to form something called like a syncytium, which is basically just, you can see how they're just dividing, not dividing, like just spreading and trying to penetrate it from as much area as they can, just going through. They're not, it's just, it's not a big cluster of cells that's going inside. They're actually going through different parts and trying to just spread around and penetrate as much as they can. If I go back to this picture, you can see it's spreading, it's trying to spread as much as it can. And you can see here that the syncytiotrophoblasts are actually the ones that are trying to penetrate it and go through it, while the cytotrophoblasts, they're just there as a membrane, okay? So this is the first division. We have the cytotrophoblasts. We are going to form these two layers, okay? Uh, if you guys have any questions, you can just stop me, okay? Now, the successful implantation, it takes about five days, okay? And this is just some numbers that you guys uh, need to be familiar familiar with, and it's completed by day 12, which is day 26 of a woman's menstrual, menstrual cycle. Yani, the menstrual cycle usually, normally, it consists about 28 days and um, implantation kind of, uh, like if the woman was to, were to get pregnant, implantation would be complete by day 26 of the cycle, okay? So basically what happens, let's take, and let's look at it this way. If we do not have a pregnancy, okay? If there's no pregnancy, 
what happens? Usually period or menstruation occurs, okay? What is, what is menstruation? The blood that comes is basically this endometrium kind of shedding off because we said that the endometrium, it's going to thicken, right? So it's, it's gonna be, it's gonna thicken and to prepare itself for the embryo. But if there's no embryo, what's gonna happen? It's just gonna shed and we're gonna have menstruation, okay? So when there is an actual embryo, we need to make sure that menstruation does not occur. We need to make sure that the embryo sticks and it does not just flush away and so we need to make sure that menstruation does not occur. How does this happen? Basically, we have a structure inside the ovary called corpus luteum. What you need to know is that it's just a group of cells, okay? And what, what, what it does is that it secretes progesterone and estrogen. These estrogens and progesterone, if you notice, they have to stay high during pregnancy and they are like, and they're produced by the corpus luteum. So we need to keep the corpus luteum uh, we're going to need to keep it to produce like the estrogens and progesterone. And that's what the embryo is going to do. Basically, we said that the sensitive trophoblast, remember, the cells that are penetrating uh, the uh, endometrium, they're going to secrete a hormone called HCG, the human gonadotropic hormone. This hormone is going to keep the corpus luteum uh, to secreting estrogen and progesterone. This is why you notice that during pregnancy tests, what is measured usually? We measure HCG, okay? Because this, this hormone is only like, it's produced by these sensitiotrophoblasts, meaning that we have an actual embryo and that the corpus luteum should continue producing progesterone and estrogen. Is this part clear? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. yes. Now, we have embedded the embryo and it's inside and it's, it's just, we're gonna, it's gonna form the placenta. The placenta is basically the organ that's going to, you can say just house the baby during the pregnancy. It's the one that's gonna make sure that it gets all it, its nutrition and all of the wastes that are produces, produced by the baby, they're gonna be um, taken care of and just excreted properly, okay? So we need to see how the placenta is going to be formed, okay? So we are now at day eight of the blastocyst, okay, at uh, day eight of implantation. So basically, you can see that there are a lot of new words over here, but we're going to go through them right now. Okay. First thing you need to, let's take a closer look at this first part over here. Right here at day eight, we're going to have something called an embryonic disc. What is the embryonic disc? Basically, remember how we said we have the trophoblasts on the outside and the embryo blasts on the inside? So we said that the trophoblasts, they're already divided. We have the cytotrophoblast and the syncytio. Now, what's going to divide the embryoblasts, the one that were on the inside, okay? They're going to divide into two layers. One is called the hypoblast and one is called the epiblast, okay? So these are the two layers. And now when these two have formed, we call this an embryonic disc. Now, I put these for you so that you know what these, like what they develop into. The hypoblast, it's going to form the yolk sac later on and the extra embryonic mesoderm. And the epiblast is going to form the germ layers and its lines. If you look here, we can see something called the amniotic cavity. It's this blue cavity over here. And it's lined by which cells? The epiblast, okay? So we have now, so, so far, we just have the syncytiotrophoblast. They continue going inside. We have the cytotrophoblasts on the, uh, covering the actual uh, embryo and then the cavity inside. And then now we have the new, the, the embryonic disc, epiblast and hypoblast, okay? Is this clear or too many words? Yes, so- Do we have to memorize the names in the figures? <laughs> you have to, okay. It's once you repeat it a couple of times, you're gonna be familiar, familiar with it. Just take it step by step, okay? And you're gonna notice that the same ones are repeated over and over, you know? So if we look at day 12 right now, we're gonna see that implantation is officially complete. That's it. The whole embryo, the whole blastocyst, it's inside the, um, the endometrium and cholos. It's fully embedded, okay? So here you can notice that we have these kind of holes forming in the uh, syncytiotrophoblast. What are these holes? These holes are what we call lacunae. They're just spaces that are forming. Why do we have these spaces? These spaces, didn't we say that um, the, uh, the blood vessels inside the endometrium, they're gonna become leaky? Now, this is why, this is where the thing gets important. The blood, blood is going to 
come inside these spaces. And this is where the embryo is going to get its nutrition from. It's no longer in the uterine cavity. So it can no longer take the secretions from the uterus. It's going to need a new form of uh, a new form of nutrition, and that's going to come from the blood vessels right here. So we have these spaces that are formed, and they're going to be filled with blood later on. Okay. Now, what else do we have? I said that this yellow part. We said that this was the hypoblast, right? And it's going to form a structure that is called the yolk sac. Okay. And we also have the extra embryonic mesoderm forming. These are, you don't really have to uh, know what they are exactly. You just kind of have to be familiar that they're forming right now, okay? So next, we have the 16-day uh, embryo, okay? This is where you guys, I think, if you studied, you would know that the like the germ layers right now we're gonna that are actually going to form the entire human body. The three ger germ layers: the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. Now uh, Khalid is going to explain it uh, afterwards. Okay, so by day 16, we're going to see these three germ layers forming, and these three germ layers they're going to give rise to all of the organs in our body. They're going to basically form our entire human body. Okay, and. That's basically the highlights that you need to know from this figure. And I have, okay, now you're going to notice that we saw these two words over here, the chorion and the chorionic villi. Now, we said all of this, all of these developments are to form what? To form the placenta, right? Now, the placenta, it has two parts. It has a fetal part and it has a maternal part, okay? So, the fetal part is what we call the chorion. So the chorion is just basically the fetal portion of the placenta, okay? And the chorionic villi, it's just like, it's developing these villi, these kind of branches. It's just ex expanding more and more, okay? So, so far, is everything clear? Yes. Okay, do you guys yes. have any questions? What's the function of the amniotic cavity? It's not written in the book. Khaled is going to explain it now for you guys. Uh, you're you're going to, all of these structures that I kind of uh, went over quickly, he's going to explain them to you, okay? So. Uh, I have a question. Uh, what forms the chorion exactly? The chorion is basically, all of this structure, it's just, it's the fetal part of the placenta. You're going to see, you don't need to know the details exactly, but you just need to know that it's this part of the, uh, like the, cy the cytotrophoblasts and the membranes and you, just a lot of different structures at the point, but you just need to know that it's the fetal portion of the placenta. Don't go into too much detail. Okay, thank you. So uh, it's uh, formed by the cytotrophoblast. It's formed by a lot of different structures joining together. Yeah, and just yeah, and you you, all, you only need to know that it's the fetal portion of the placenta. You're gonna worry about these details in year one. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. So. The uh, placenta, okay, so now the placenta is starting to form, okay? And we said that it consists of a fetal portion and a maternal portion. What do we call the maternal portion? We call it the decidua basalis, okay? So the decidua basalis is just uh, parts that forms the placenta and it belongs to the mother. It's from the mother, mother's body, you know? And then the chorion, it's from the fetus, okay? And it's going to develop, like I said, the finger-like projections, which we call the chorionic villi. It's just trying to expand and grow as much as it can, okay? And these, like, okay, so now we have the chorionic villi and we have the decidua basalis. They're going to be filled with the maternal blood. And this is basically, that's it. This is developing into the placenta, okay? And you're going to notice now we have something called the decidua capsularis, all you need to know is that it's just the remaining part of the uterus because we said that the placenta and the child and the fetus, they're expanding, right? They're filling out the entire uterus. But there's a small portion that's remaining and it's not its not part of the placenta. It's not part of the lalcorion, um, the maternal portion of the placenta. It's just there and it's just part of the uterus and we call it dua capsularis. Okay? And this is... Uh, that's it. We have, you can notice that the placenta has formed and it's usually by the end of the third month of pregnancy. And you can notice that here, you don't have to worry yourself with all these details. You just need to know that you know, in the placenta, we have an exchange in the blood of the mother and the fetus. We know we get all of our nutrients and the oxygen 
from the blood, right? So the mother is going to give the oxygen and the nutrients to the baby. And then the baby is forming all of these um, metabolites and carbon dioxide, all of the waste products. We It can't get rid of it on its own, right? So it's going to go to the mother and the mother is going to excrete it. So that's the kind of exchange that happens. The mother gives the child the oxygen and the nutrients and the child um, the, gives the mother the waste products that it forms, okay? But they don't actually intermix because if you mix the good blood with the bad blood, it's not going to work out. They are as close to each other, exchange happens, but the bloods do not mix whatsoever, okay? And once the placenta is fully formed, it takes the function of secreting HCG, which we said, what secretes HCG first during the first months? Corpus luteum. The syncytiotrophoblasts, okay? So at this stage, the placenta takes over that function. Uh, is everything clear? In the last figure, um, some names are written on the figure, but in the book, they did not clarify any of this point. So do I have to go in deep and no. understand each point? No, no, you don't have to. Yeah, and you, if, yeah, if they're not exactly, if they're not written in the text, you don't really have to look at them. I think at your level, all you need to be familiar with are these, the cytotrophoblasts, the hypoblasts, all of these ones, okay? But as far as you're concerned, methylene and no. These parts, and I see they're repeated, the basalis, the chorion, you know, the umbilical cord. So, I'm saying in high fetal venule arch, you're not really, you don't need to know them, you know? So, just skip through them, like, they're not really important, okay? Timam, one more question. The doctor earlier said we have to know um, which structure arises from which. What does she mean by that? And no, okay. Like I showed you, for example, here, uh, here. You can look at this one. For example, the hypoblast, it gives rise to the yolk sac. The uh, hypoblast also forms the extra embryonic mesoderm. This is for the embryonic part. But now you're going to notice, uh, I think what your doctor meant is for the germ layers, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, the endoderm. What, what do they form? And my friend is going to explain this right now. Okay, Shikran. So, okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to my part and the other. So you guys can see me? Okay. Okay, so. Hi, guys. Okay. So why did I open camera? Because my part requires a lot of um, a lot of uh, imagination and visualization. So I just want to go over something uh, about the hormones and uh, and for the placenta. Just I just want to show you this uh, graph, which is gonna make things easy uh, easy on you. So as you can see here. Uh, we have an increase of uh, human coronic uh, gonadotropin. You know why the function, what's the main function of the uh, human uh, coronic gonadotropin? It is to uh, stimulate the corpus luteum, to tell the corpus luteum that corpus luteum increase the estrogen and progesterone. There is an implanted, uh, it, uh, there is an implanted fetus, increase it. So as you can see here, it's gonna start increasing and it's gonna tell the corpus luteum, okay, increase, okay, increase. After some time, after the placenta is formed, what did we say about the placenta? There's two main functions I want you guys to remember for the placenta, okay? For the hormone secretions, the estrogen and progesterone, and uh, the, the nutrition, okay? The nutrition of the baby. There's important two functions of the placenta. So once the placenta, as you can see here, uh, about in the third, um, third, uh, like third month, as you can see here, the human uh, chronic uh, gonadotropin is decreasing. Why? Because the placenta took over the function. Now we do not need the corpus luteum to uh, to to uh, to uh, secrete the estrogen and progesterone. We don't need the corpus luteum. Now the placenta is independent. It can secrete these hormones alone. So I just wanted to emphasize on this uh, on this graph, so you can just understand what do we mean by the. Uh, by the placenta and the hormones, because I guess many of you had uh, troubles in the hormones. And okay, so now I'm gonna start with the actual part, which I'm going to explain gastrulation. It requires a lot of, uh, we have a question. Yes. Someone raise their hands. Uh, yeah, um, my question is, um, yeah. why does the placenta take over the HCG? It's, 
it's not there's no like I don't know how to explain but there is no this is the function of the placenta the placenta was made to for the nutrition and for the taking over of uh, first first of all why do we need human uh, the SCG we need it to stimulate to tell the corpus luteum okay increase the progesterone and estrogen after some time the placenta is going to take over this is the function of the placenta that's why placenta was made that's why God made it it's to give home to to make the estrogen and progesterone Okay, so like I don't think like you can say that what well, like why the placenta is like this, but that's that's the function of the placenta, you know. Um, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So now we are we finished uh, all of these uh, steps. By the way, I just want to emphasize another point. Uh, all of this what is uh, what was explained before it happened in the in week two. That's why some people call week two as week of twos because the trophoblast, for example, it's going to differentiate into two things, cytotrophoblast and syncytial trophoblast. And for example, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the epi, the epi, uh, the embryo blast is going to differentiate it also two things, which is what? The epiblast and the hypoblast. So that's why you remember week of two, uh, the second week is week of twos, where differentiation of two things. Okay, now we're starting with three uh, with week three, where the blastocyst, we call the blastocyst, is now becoming more mature, but now we call it not blastocyst, we call it a gastrol. Okay, so there's two important things about the gastrol. We have a three primary germ layer, and it has extra embryonic membranes. Okay, so now let's first, I'm gonna start by, uh, I, I'm gonna start by the extra embryonic membrane, and then I'm gonna go and explain the uh, three primary germ layer. Okay, so as you can see here, the embryo blast, which I mentioned before, it divides into the epiblast and the hypoblast. And what do we call it? Embryonic disc. And it also has another name, bilaminar germ layer. Okay, by it's by is two. So epiblast and hypoblast, we call it a bilaminar germ layer. Now we have uh, in week three, like the these extra embryonic membranes mostly develop on week two and week three, but the full maturation of them happens on week three. Uh, we have four extra embryonic membranes I want you guys to remember and focus on. We have the amnion, the yolk sac, allentos, and the chorion. Chorion was previously explained. Okay, so it forms, uh, it is a part of the placenta. I won't get into much details with the chorion, yet I'm going to be explaining these three important extra embryonic membranes. So what's an amnion? Let's first start with an amnion. Okay, as you can see here, this is the epiblast. The epiblast cells are going to start and proliferate, and they're going to make something like a balloon. Okay, as you can see here, it's it makes something like a circle. Okay, so these cells above uh, that comes from the epiblast, we call them the amnion. Okay, so as you can see here, the you can see. Okay, now is it good? You can. Okay. I'll just come here. Okay. It's good now. Can see my hands? Yes. Okay. Yes, it's good. Okay. So the the epiblast cells they're going to proliferate and they're going to do something like this. Okay. And there these cells that are here, as you can see here, these cells we call them the amnion. Okay. Now the amnion is there. The amnion cells are there. The amnion membrane is there. We created a cavity. What do we call this cavity? The cells around it is amnion. This cavity is called amniotic cavity. Okay. What's inside this amniotic cavity? The amniotic fluid. Okay, so, uh, so as I said, the epiblast cells are going to differentiate and proliferate, basically divide, and they're going to go up like this. And then they're going to create like a space. What do we call it? Uh, amniotic cavity. Inside this amniotic cavity, what do we have? We have the amniotic fluid. Okay, so what's the function of the amniotic fluid? Amniotic fluid is really, really important for the baby and even if you decrease in the level and the volume of the amniotic fluid, it can cause a lot of uh, problems for the baby. The main function that I want you guys to focus on for the amniotic fluid is that it prevents from trauma. The mother can be hit or something on her or on her uterus, okay. And if the amniotic fluid wasn't there, the the baby is going to be is, is going to uh, to have a severe trauma because of the hit. So the amniotic fluid prevents that from happening. Okay, this is the first function of the amniotic fluid. Uh, whenever the baby is developing, the baby wants to move around. I want uh, the baby wants smooth movement. The amniotic fluid provides that smooth movement for the baby. 
okay? And when baby is developing, we don't want the parts and the organs to fuse together. Uh, the amniotic fluid will also prevent the fusion of uh, of the um, of the organs together. Okay, now we're done with the amnion. Okay, let's go on to the allentose. Okay, when I say allentose, I just want you guys to remember just important point, uh, uh, the um, umbilical cord. It forms the structural base of the umbilical cord. Here's a picture, okay, it actually helped me when I was foundation to visualize things. As you can see here, we call this is the amnion, okay? And this is the amniotic, flu uh, amniotic cavity, which has the amniotic uh, fluid. And as you can see here, this is the arintos. It's also an extra embryonic membrane that's going to come out from the baby and it's going to form the basic structures of the uh, umbilical cord. So uh, the umbilical cord, you know, guys, what's an umbilical cord, I guess? Umbilical cord is basically a connection from the baby to the placenta. So actually uh, nutritional blood and oxygen can move from the mother to the, uh, to the fetus and uh, the waste and mat waste material can move from the fetus to the mother back so they can be excreted. That's for the allentose. Moving on to the yolk sac. Yolk sac in the humans, they usually do not really focus on them, yet they have an important function. They are important, but yolk sac mostly they're on, on animals that lay eggs. Uh, yolk sac play a very important role in the, uh, in the nutrition of the, of, the, uh, of the animal until it hatches. That's for the yolk sac and the animals. In yolk sac in our in humans, it difference. It forms the part of. Uh, I'm gonna be explaining and showing you guys a picture. When the fetus is folding, the yolk sac forms part of the digestive tube. Uh, so it's that's the main thing I want you guys to remember: digestive tube. And also for the earliest uh, RBCs, red blood cells, they come out from the uh, yolk sac. And by the way, for the yolk sac, I want you guys to remember. Uh, as you can see, this is the yolk sac. This is the yolk sac, okay? From where does the yolk sac come? It comes from the hypoplast. The hypoplast cells are also going to proliferate and differentiate like this, but down, so they are going to form what? It's going to form a cavity. We call it what? A, a, a yolk sac, okay? So the epiplast cells proliferate to form the amnion, and the, uh, the hypoplast cells are going to differentiate to form this cavity. We call it what? A yolk sac. Okay, this is also a picture as you can see here. This is the amnion, uh, this is the yolk sac, this is the allentose. Okay, I'll just, I think we need to change some place. Just give me one minute, I'll change my place and come back, okay? Hey, I'm really sorry, guys, but um, M27 is basically closing on us, and we don't know how to explain. So we're sitting in the middle of M27. Okay, it doesn't matter. Not our problem. Okay, so this is it for the extra embryonic membranes. Just visualize, uh, try to understand the picture, and everything for the extra embryonic membrane, it's going to be very clear. So as you can see here, I just messed one part for the chorion. The chorion is basically a membrane that is going to enclose the whole fetus, everything from the fetus. And this part of the chorion, as you can see here, which was explained before, it is the what? It's the chorionic villi. Okay, now let's start with the uh, differentiation. I, I said two important things about a gastrula, as you can see here. We said the extra embryonic membranes, which I actually explained, and I said the three primary germ layers. So how does these three primary germ layers arise? How, they de how do they develop? So this process, we call it gastrulation, okay? The process of the uh, formation of, uh, of the three primary germ layers, we call it gastrulation. I want you guys to imagine that you are in the amniotic fluid and you're looking down. So basically you're standing in the amniotic fluid, okay, standing upright, and now you're looking down. What's your, what you are going to see, we are talking about we are in week three. What you are going to see, you're going to see a structure like this, okay? And when week three starts, 
a primitive streak, a line like this is going to start forming, okay? We call this a primitive streak. And at the end here, it's not really, you don't really need to know it, but we call it a primitive node. But I re really need you guys to remember this is called a primitive streak. So week three starts gastrulation. The first step of gastrulation is the formation of the primitive streak. Okay, now we have the primitive streak. Now we want to do the three germ layer. What do we have our issue? We have the epiblast and the hypoblast. Now we want more. We want, we want three different germ layers, okay? Through the primitive streak, through the primitive th streak, the epiblast cells, they're going to start to enter inside, okay? And they're going to displace the hypoblast cells, forming uh, a, a germ layer. We call it the endoderm. What do we mean by endo? Endo means inside. That's why we call it endoderm. Okay, so the epiblast cells are going to start entering through the primitive streak, displacing the hypoblast cells and making a new germ layer. We call it an endoderm. More cells are going to start to enter. Now they're forming something we call it a mesoderm. Okay, after that, some cells are going to left to be left outside. Uh, and what do we call these uh, cells that are left outside? We call them ectoderm. Ecto means outside, endo means inside. Did everyone understand this? Because it's really important. Yes. Can you please repeat it? Okay, yeah, sure. I'm going to repeat it again. Okay, so you are standing in the amniotic fluid, okay? Looking down. Try to imagine yourself. You are in the amniotic fluid looking down. What you're going to see, you're going to see a structure like this, okay? And when this, you see the structures, okay? You're going to see something like a line. Okay, we call this line primitive streak, and this is uh, this uh, this is the first step of gastrulation and the formation of the three primary germ layer. Okay, now through the primitive streak, what do we have here? The epiblast, sah? Right? The epiblast cells they're gonna start going through the primitive streak like this. In this way, they're gonna start going through the primitive streak. They're going to displace the epiblast cells. The I mean the hypoblast cells. They're going to start to displace them and they're going to form a layer. We call it the endoderm. I just want you guys to remember endoderm, endo, like the term endo, you took it in uh, English, I guess. Endo means inside. Just remember it from endoderm, endo means inside. More cells are going to start entering from the, the epiblast cells. More epiblast cells are going to start entering through the primitive streak. Okay. Now they're going to form another germ layer. We call it what? A mesoderm. Okay. And um, and then the cells that are left outside, they're gonna form a layer. We call it the ectoderm. Ecto means what outside? Um, did did uh, did you guys understand uh, what's gastrulation exactly? Any questions? You want me to repeat? No, clear. Thank you. Is it clear? Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay. Now, let's talk about uh, mesoderm, ectoderm, and the endoderm. Okay, uh, so these each primary, each germ layer, each germ layer forms some organs in our body. We are starting to form the organs. Okay, so for the mesoderm, I want you guys, and by the way, just for this uh, mesenchyme, this was a question that was asked in, uh, in some of the tests, which I got wrong. That's why I want you guys to not do this mistake. Uh, these are the cells that make up the mesoderm. Okay, the, it was one of the MCQ questions that was asked. So remember, mesenchyme, just remember from the M, mesoderm, okay, mesenchyme. They have both M's in the beginning, so just remember that. Okay, now we want to start to form the organs from the ectoderm, from the endoderm, from the mesoderm. Organogenesis, what do we mean by organ? Organogenesis, genesis means the making, the formation. Okay, so now let's start to understand what are the uh, the cell layers that make up uh, that make that these these layers do. Endoderm. From the endoderm, basically the linings linings of all the organs happen from the endoderm because it's the inside layer, right? It's the, for the inside layer, the epithelial lining of digestive, respiratory, the reproductive tract. Okay. Um, okay. The epithelial lining of the digestive, the respiratory tract, urethra, bladder, the reproductive system, all of these lining are formed from the endoderm. Why from the endoderm? Because it is, it is the first layer. It is like from the inside, okay? Now, moving on to the mesoderm. 
mesoderm, remember from the M. What what did I tell you to remember from the M? Mesenchyme. And I want you to remember other thing, M uh, muscles. Okay, the mesoderm forms most of like more, not most, all of the muscles in our body, they are formed by the mesoderm. The musculoskeletal system is formed from the mesoderm. The muscular layer of the gastrointestinal tract is formed from the mesoderm layer. And all of the CVS, the circulatory system that involves the heart is also formed from the mesoderm. Okay, this is for the mesoderm. Now we talked about the endoderm and we talked about the mesoderm. Now let's move on to the ectoderm. Ectoderm, I want you guys to remember anything that has contact with the outside world, uh, it, it is formed from the ectoderm. Whether it is the skin, the hair, the nails, your ears, your eyes, your nose, all of these have contact with the outside world. So they make, they form the ectoderm from its name. Ecto means outside. So uh, these, the ectoderm forms all of these structures. And other thing that an ectoderm forms is the nervous system. And how does it form the nervous system? By a process, another process, we call it neurulation. Before I go to neurulation, I just want to make sure you guys understood uh, why these cell layers form these structures. You, everyone understood that? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, and by the way, I just want to, uh, just I forgot this point where it's folding. Basically, we just need to know that, uh, as you can see here, this is the ectoderm, this is, this is the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. They are like a straight and flat sheet. Whenever they start, they're gonna start folding like this in this way. Uh, you know that fetus, they they look this way, so so this process we call it folding. They these process these uh, germ layers are gonna start and to fuse with each other to actually form an organ. So in the process of the folding, uh, we call this folding process the folding. You know. That's, uh, that's what you uh, really need to know from the folding. If you want to read more, it's, I guess, it, it, uh, in the book, it's uh, described in more, uh, in more description. I just want you guys to get an idea what do you mean by folding, okay? Okay, so for the ectoderm, uh, I said the ectoderm forms what? The nervous system. So this, the nervous system is formed by a process we call it neurulation. How does neurulation start, okay? As you can see here, in the mesoderm, we have something, a uh, structure, we call it a uh, notochord. This notochord is going to release some chemicals and tell to act the, the ectoderm, this layer, the ectoderm, is going to tell it thicken. So this uh, notochord, this, I'm going to explain again, notochord is going to send some chemicals to the ectoderm, and it's going to tell the ectoderm to thicken. This, when it starts to thicken, we call it what? A neural plate, okay? So when the neural plate starts to thicken, like let's say for example, you you have a mass, a high mass and low mass on the outside. What's going to happen to the high mass in the center? It's going to start to go down, right? Because it's thickening, it's gonna start to go down. So whenever it goes down, it's gonna form a groove. We call this groove, we call it a neural groove. And these folds, these as you can see here, we call them neural folds. Okay, I'm gonna be repeating again. We have a structure from the mesoderm, a notochord. This notochord, uh, by the way, the notochord is, is going to be the future vertebral column, okay? So the notochord is going to send some chemicals to the ectoderm and it's going to tell it thick, uh, thicken. And when it's thicken, we call it a neural plate. And when we increase the mass of anything, what happens is it starts to go down. Okay, as you can see here, it went down because it's increasing in mass, it's thickening, okay? And then we're gonna form a groove here. We call it the neural groove. And then here, the folds, we call it what? The neural folds, okay? And here, by the way, these are the neural crust. They're gonna form the uh, peripheral nervous system. And I'm gonna be explaining uh, now in the next slide, okay? Now, now, as you can see here, it's gonna go down. The neural folds, by time, they're going to what? They're going to fuse. They're going to join together, okay? When they fuse, they're gonna form something, we call it a neural tube. This neural tube is going to be the central nervous system. What do we mean by central nervous system? The brain and the spinal cord. Spinal cord and the brain, they are the central nervous system. I mentioned before the neural crust too. The neural crust is going to form the peripheral nervous system. Uh, the nerve, uh, peripheral nervous system is basically all the nervous system except the brain and the spinal cord. Okay, that's the peripheral nervous system, if, if you guys don't know it. Okay, so that's it for the, really for the, uh, for the formation and the neural and the formation of the neural tube. Did everyone get what do we mean by uh, 
neural uh, uh, neuralation. Do you want me guys to repeat any point you didn't understand? Uh, so yes, neural please. tube is forming brain and nervous system. No, it's going to form the brain and the spinal cord. Okay, the central nervous system. The, the nervous system is divided into two things. I'm not going to be explaining, but like, I just want you guys to get the idea. The nervous system is divided into central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system is basically the brain and the spinal cord, like the main ones. Peripheral nervous system are other nerves that are distributed in the body. So the neural tube forms the central nervous system. Okay? Did you, uh, did you understand? Yes. Okay. So any other questions? No, thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna get uh, into more details in the what's happening exactly into the mesoderm. So the mesoderm basically have three important uh, three important uh, divisions. We have the somite. First of all, the notochord. Basically, I've explained the notochord is going to form the future uh, uh, vertebral column. It does make sense because this is going to be the spinal cord and this is going to be the uh, vertebral column. So it does make sense why the notochord is going to form the uh, the vertebral column. Okay, so I'm going to be explaining the three regions for the mesoderm. We have the somite, and we have the um, we have the intermediate, and we have the lateral uh, mesoderms. So uh, the somite are going to form some structures. The intermediate, they're going to form some structures. The lateral, they're going to form the, some structures. Okay, this this is what I'm going to try to uh, I'm, I'm trying to refer to. Okay, this is very very important. Really, and yeah, hundred percent. Some questions are going to come from this, from this, uh, from this, uh, from this uh, map. Okay, they're going to ask you, Mr. For example, the intermediate mesoderm. What does it form? Kidneys, gonads. Okay, they can ask you. Uh, so might. Uh, what are the things that they are formed? Skeletal, dermatome. You need to get familiar with what exactly the mesoderm is forming and what the ectoderm is forming, what the endoderm is forming, because. Some questions I'm, I'm repeating again. Some questions come come from this from this mind map. So I want you guys to familiarize yourself with it and understand that what are the structures that uh, that arise from each primary germ layer. Okay. Yani for example, I've explained this before. Yani the ectoderm. I said external. So anything that has contact with the outside world um, is going to be formed by the ectoderm. Okay, and the nervous system. This is very important. Remember, nervous system from the ectoderm. Anything that has contact with the outside world, ectoderm. Mesoderm, anything related to muscles, circulatory system. This comes from the mesoderm. Just remember from the M, this M. Remember M, mesoderm, muscles, okay? As you can see here, I've mentioned before, not cord, the intervertebral disc. The somite is going to form uh, the ribs, the bones. So, so basically, the musculoskeletal system is going to come from the mesoderm. Okay, the endoderm, I just want you to remember this important word, epithelial lining. Epithelial lining of what? Most of the things, GIT tract of the gastrointestinal tract, respiratory, uh, the reproductive system. So remember epithelial lining from the endoderm. Did everyone get what are the different structures that are going to arise? It's very important. Yes. Okay, and if you're gonna ask me, should I, uh, like because I have the same question, should I remember the same words? Yeah, exactly. Yes, you should. You have to. So my plan, like you have to get. You have to because questions are gonna come. Okay. So uh, this is stages of labor. We're just gonna leave it. Okay. Uh, for now. Okay. So we have for the changes. I'm done with gas relation and your relation. I just want to make sure you guys understood everything. If you, do you have any question about gas relation and your relation? Did you guys understand everything about gas relation and neurulation? Yes. yes. But, but yes. again, what is the mean of neurulation? What? The meaning of neurulation. Neurulation is basically the formation of the neural tube. As you can see here, this is neurulation. See? See? We are forming the neural tube. We are forming the nervous system from its name, neural, okay? Nervous system, something involved in the nervous system. We are basically forming the neural tube. These are the steps which I explain, okay? If you didn't really get, and you can't catch up with me, I've been with the high speed, you can just refer back to the recording and you can just follow up with me in the same exact steps, okay? So that's new relation. Any other questions?
No, thank you. Okay. Okay, now uh, stages of labor, we're just gonna come back to them very soon. Okay, now for the mother changes. I'm gonna be honest with you. Uh, questions from this uh, anatomical, metabolic, physiologic, physiological changes that happen to the mother. Rarely you're going to be uh, asked about them, yet you need to understand what they're talking about. But uh, rarely some questions of them, they're gonna come. Uh, it wasn't the most important part that you focus on. It's better to put all your focus on the first part where implantation, fertilization, gas relation, put all your focus on this part. For the changes that a mother undergoes, not much of the information are gonna come at the end, okay? Not much of the information are going to come because even I was reading, yeah, some information you guys are going to cover uh, in semester two. Yet, just make sure that you cover everything because you don't want to lose any single mark. Okay, so for the anatomical changes, what do you mean by anatomical changes? Structures, anatomy, you take what, what do you mean by structures, صح? So uh, structural changes are going to happen to the mother. Metabolic changes, something that are related to hormones, vitamins, protein, carbohydrates. These, we call it metabolic changes. Physiological changes means changing in the functions of our body systems, okay? So we have three types of changes a mother will undergo. Anatomical, metabolic, physiological. Let's first discover what are the anatomical changes that a mother will undergo. We need to focus on four important, uh, actually three important organs that are gonna undergo huge anatomical changes, which are going to cause a uh, lot of changes in the other systems. Female reproductive organ. Obviously, the female reproductive organ, it's going to become more vascularized. We have, we, we actually, ha we're having a new human. The mother is having a new human in her body, صح? so. We need extra blood. So uh, the female reproductive organ is gonna come more vascular, more vascular, it's gonna be engorged with blood. More blood are gonna be in the in the female reproductive organ. And there is something we call it a Chadwick sign. Basically, in the female reproductive organ, it's gonna turn a bit of purplish uh, who we call it a Chadwick sign. That's the really the important key points you need to remember in the female reproductive organ. Okay. Moving on to the second most important thing that uh, it's going to be anatomically changing is the breast. What, you're going to ask me why the breast it is changing. We obviously need to know after after uh, after the baby is born, we have lactation. Okay, so the breast need to be ready for the lactation. So what's going to happen with the breast? It's going to start. Um, I have a picture here, which which is, as you can see here, this is a breast that's it's a normal breast. Okay. And this is a breast while uh, pregnancy. It's, as you can see here, it got enlarged, okay? And the areola, uh, as you can see here, it got darker, okay? And uh, blood supply is going to be more to the breast. So you need to remember these key points, vascular, uh, like everything is gonna become vascular, obviously, and everything is going to be enlarged. And uh, for the lactation, they're gonna start the milk glands, they're gonna start developing, uh, so they can be ready for what? for uh, providing milk for the fetus, okay? That's for the breast. And I'm gonna be explaining the exact process of lactation uh, in, in, a, in a moment, okay? For the facial skin, just remember, increase implant uh, uh, pigmentation. Pigmentation, basically the color. Uh, some uh, some uh, increase in, impl in pigmentation is gonna happen for the facial skin. Okay, for the uterus. As you can see here, the uterus is enlarging. It's taking it's taking a lot of the pelvic cavity. And as you can see here, the uterus is pressing on other organs. It's applying pressure on other organs. It's obviously going to affect the physiological effect of this system. As you can see here, the abdomen was the abdomen was free. It was like it it had a lot of room. But now after the baby is is uh, is uh, is developing, there is a pressure on the abdomen. The abdomen is getting pressured. And uh, everything is gonna go. It's gonna start moving upwards a bit, because what the uterus is applying a pressure on them. Okay. So as you can see here, the abdominal cavity is gonna start. Uh, the abdominal cavity. There are some pressure that are gonna be in, uh, by the uterus on the abdominal cavity, enlargement, and obviously it's gonna fill most of the pelvic cavity. And obviously, what's going to happen to the uterine muscles? We're gonna have hypertrophy of the uterine muscle. What do you mean by hypertrophy? Increase in muscle size. Hypertrophy means increase in muscle size. It does make sense that everything is gonna become bigger, okay? This is how you're gonna remember the anatomical changes. Anything is gonna come smaller? No, 
because we're having an extra baby and everything needs to be more vascular, uh, more blood, more enlargement. That's it for the anatomical changes, really. Uh, did you guys understand the anatomical changes? Yes. yes. Okay, metabolic changes. Uh, I just want to mention other point, uh, other point for the anatomical changes. Uh, nutrition. Nutrition is very important. As you know, whenever we have a pregnant lady, we tell her, focus on your food. What do you eat? Why? Because it can affect the baby. Whatever the mother eats is going to be passed to the fetus. So she needs to be, she needs to uh, take me, يعني, يعني, be careful with what she eats. And most of, I just want you guys to remember this important uh, vitamin, which is folic acid. Many uh, pregnant lady, I don't know if you have heard that before, many pregnant lady, they are told to take folic acid uh, supplement. Why? Because uh, folic acid, if there was any deficiency in the folic acid, uh, it can cause some neurological problems uh, for the fetus. So always pregnant lady, they are told to uh, supplement with folic acid. That's it for the nutrition. Uh, just for, remember folic acid, neurological, uh, neurological uh, function, okay? So uh, it's, it's something new, but you need to remember folic acid, neurological uh, function. Okay, for metabolic changes. Metabolic changes, basically we mean uh, hormones, vitamins. These are metabolic changes. Three important hormones that there were mentioned in your book uh, that I'm gonna be explaining, human placental lactogen. Human placental lactogen, it plays a very, very important role in the lactation process. Okay, and other things that it, it plays in is basically lipo lipolysis. What do we mean by lipolysis? Lipo, the, the name itself, it means fat. Lysis means breakdown. So whenever a mother, uh, a mother is pregnant, she, she needs a lot of energy, صح? So we need to break down the fat. So uh, the human placental lactogen is going to break, this, break down this fat. And also for the glucose, a lot of, we need a lot of glucose for the mother. We need energy for the mother. So the glucose production is going also to be done by the human placental lactogen. Any, do you need to know more than this? I don't think. Just remember lipolysis and glycogenesis. These are very important things. And obviously you need to remember that it plays a very important role in the lactation. Okay, moving on to the uh, corticotropin releasing hormone. Uh, I need you to remember when I say CRH, uh, corticotropin, uh, uh, corticotropin releasing hormone, maturation is very important for the maturation of the breast. Okay, anything that, um, and also maturation, not for the breast, not for the, uh, not for the breast, also a maturation of uh, most of the organs that are going to be ready after the baby is born. Okay, and you need to remember now, uh, now glucose uh, mostly is going to be saved for the baby. As you know, we need energy for the baby too, so it's not just the mother. We, the baby needs some uh, kind of food. So what does this CRH do? It's going to save the glucose that's taken in by the mother and it's going to give it for the baby, not the mother. The mother, most of her energy is going to come from fat, but uh, the fetus, most of the fetus energy is going to come from what? And the food, nutrition, is gonna come from glucose. And this is the function of the CRH. So remember, lactation and uh, sp uh, sparing glucose for the fetus. Okay, now uh, this is for the CRH. Do you need to know more? I don't think. This is the most important keywords you need to remember. Placental growth hormone. As we know, in a normal human being, we have the growth hormone that's important for the development of the human. Whenever a lady becomes pregnant, this growth hormone is suppressed. We have an other hormone that plays the role of the growth hormone. We call it the placental growth hormone. So basically, this placental uh, growth hormone, it's very important for the maturation of the, of the baby. It helps in the maturation of the baby. And also, it's always to, uh, you need to remember that uh, it's important whenever the lady is, is uh, giving delivery, we have a lot of stress. So, so this, the placental growth hormone, it protects the mother from this kind of stress. And obviously, you need to remember the CTH and the cortisol level rise. Uh, it's very detailed. These hormones are very detailed. I'm not going to get into exact details of each hormone because it's very detailed. Just need to remember ACTH and the cortisol levels, they're going to increase. Okay. For the, uh, and other metabolic changes is uh, vitamin D. Why do we need vitamin D? As you all know, vitamin D is very important for the absorption of calcium. If we do not have, if we do not have vitamin D, we won't be able to absorb calcium. 
okay? Uh, why is calcium important? Bone formation, bone development to get strong bones. So that's why we need vitamin D. So uh, for the, uh, so, um, the vitamin D levels, they're going to increase. So they are going to help the baby to form the bones of the baby. Uh, the, it's going to make the mother's uh, bones much more stronger. So it's very important. Vitamin D levels are going to increase. So the absorption of calcium is going to increase. Everyone understood uh, everything about metabolic changes? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, physiological changes. Uh, physiological changes, when I say physiological changes, I want you guys to remember uh, to remember uh, very important key terms. Everything is going to increase. Like whenever I say pregnancy, we're having an extra human, so we need to remember that everything is going to be incre increasing. Gastrointestinal system. What do you mean by uh, gastrointestinal system is basically the abdomen, the small intestine, the large intestine. So the ut I've mentioned before, the uterus is going to apply some pressure on the on the abdomen. So this applied pressure, it can cause some of uh, it can decrease the motility of uh, of the of the uh, large intestine, and this can cause constipation. Okay, and obviously nausea, vomiting, heartburn is going to be caused. Why heartburn is going to be caused? We know that in our stomach, okay, we have uh, hydrochloric acid. I don't know if you guys uh, uh, know this, know this, but like in our stomach to digest food, we have hydrochloric acid. Whenever this hydrochloric acid it moves up and like there is a reflex of the hydrochloric acid, it's going to uh, go to the esophagus, basically the food tube, and it's going to cause something we call a heartburn. Uh, for the urinary system, uh, we have extra waste. We have extra waste from the fetus, so that means uh, extra urine. And also, we said that blood is going to increase more blood. That means more blood to filter. That means more urine also. So you need to remember, for your urinary system, you need to remember more urine is going to be uh, formed. Respiratory system. Uh, I've seen that they mentioned uh, tidal volume, respiratory rate, and the residual volume. These exact key terms you're going to be discovering uh, in the respiratory system uh, chapter. I'm just going to be talking about them brief, uh, brief, uh, briefly. Uh, tidal volume is basically the volume of uh, air you uh, exhale and uh, exhale and inhale. This is basically uh, the, uh, the tidal volume. So it does make sense that you're having an extra baby, you need extra oxygen. So the tidal volume is going to increase. The inhalation and the exhalation volume of air is going to increase. Respiratory rate, uh, basically the breaths per minute, it's not going to change. It's going to stay uh, the same uh, throughout pregnancy and uh, with pregnancy and without pregnancy, the respiratory rate is going to be uh, stay the same. Residual volume is going to decrease. What do we mean by residual volume? Again, these T terms are going to be discovered in the respiratory chapter, uh, but I'm just going over them briefly so you can get an idea what I'm talking about. When we exhale, there is some air that's going to be left uh, in the lungs. So we call this left air uh, residual volume. So this residual volume is going to decrease. We're not going to have much of air left in our lungs after we exhale. Cardiovascular system, very important. Cardiovascular system is like the most uh, system that gets physiologically affected when there is pregnancy. Blood volume is going to increase. Uh, the water content of the body, they're going to increase. Um, the cardiac output, what do you mean by cardiac output? Basically, the blood taken, uh, the blood uh, pumped into our body is called the cardiac output. It's going to increase. Um, so you need to remember, blood volume is going to increase because we're having uh, we're having a, a fetus. We need to we need to supply this fetus too. So the blood volume is going to increase, and also other function why blood uh, is going to increase. Whenever uh, delivery is happening, the mother loses a lot of blood. So we need to compensate. So this uh, why blood is increasing. So it can compensate for the lost blood in pregnancy. Um, really, that's it you need to know on the physiological changes. And, and again, I'm, I'm just exp I'm explaining again, these changes, most of the, like, if you're going to get some questions, they're going to be few, but uh, don't take my word because I'm saying this from what uh, we took. They even, they even canceled this part, by the way, for our, uh, for our year, they canceled this part. Yet uh, it wasn't canceled for your uh, for your batch, so you need to just get over them very quickly and understand what's happening in each system and what uh, hormones are exactly increasing and what uh, kind of anatomical changes is, is happening. Okay, that's it for the three changes. 
Did you guys understand? Do you have any questions from the three changes I just explained? No, thank you. OK, perfect. Homeostatic imbalances. In this uh, chapter, uh, sorry to uh, yes. ask, I have a question regarding urine. You said that, uh, or isn't urine stored in the amniotic fluid? No. OK, uh, some uh, not all the like, uh, let's say, for example, we have a pregnancy of nine months. OK, it doesn't make sense that if all the urine that's excreted from the baby is going to stay in the amniotic fluid. So if if the all urine the baby excreted throughout the nine months is uh, is only stored in the amniotic fluid, the amniotic fluid is going to become like very big. So some of the urine was uh, like after some times the urine is going to be passed through the placenta. We call it the waste of the fetus and it's going to be passed to the placenta and it's going to be excreted uh, by the mother. So it doesn't make sense that all the urine that's going to be uh, uh, excreted by the baby is going to be in the amniotic fluid. Okay, does that answer your question? Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay, perfect. Homeostatic imbalances, very important. Focus on them because 100% questions come from uh, uh, come from the homeostatic imbalances. Like, especially in semester two, homeostatic imbalances are going to make like 70% of your exams. Uh, in this chapter, I've seen that there was three homeostatic imbalances. I just want you guys to remember uh, them very, very well because they're very important and questions like 100% they're gonna come from them. Okay, so whenever uh, I've mentioned before that um, that whenever uh, a mother is, is pregnant, they're advised to stop alcohol, they stop smoking. So why do you think we, we tell the mother to stop them? Because these, these dangerous substances can be passed uh, from the mother to the baby. So this dangerous substance, they have a name. We call it the, the teratogens. These, uh, the teratogens, they are, they are the dangerous substance that can cause problems, abdominal changes, abnormal, I mean, abnormal changes to the baby. So they're always, mothers are always, when they're pregnant, they're always advised to uh, stop uh, smoking, stop alcohol. If they didn't stop, here they mentioned one important thing about alcohol. If the mother didn't stop alcohol, um, uh, they can have adverse effects. There is a syndrome, we call it a fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, with, which is basically an intellectual disability uh, syndrome. So uh, this is if the mother doesn't, uh, doesn't stop consuming alcohol uh, in her uh, pregnancy period. Um, and by the way, uh, there is a very critical period that mothers are always advised not to take like anything dangerous from the third week to the eighth week. Why uh, this period is, we call it the critical period because all the organs are going to be forming in this period, okay? So the mother are advised, especially in the third and the eighth week, obviously the whole pregnancy, she didn't should smoke and alcohol, but critical period, we have a critical period from the third to the eighth week, uh, they're advised not to take anything because it's the, or, uh, the organogenesis period, the organs are forming, okay? Moving on, uh, did you guys understand the first one? Yes. Perfect. OK, for the second one, preeclampsia. Preeclampsia, you don't really need to know much about the causes, much about uh, much about it. You just need to know what's uh, what's given to you. Preeclampsia is basically uh, when the mother has some hypertension. Uh, what do you mean by hypertension? You guys you guys know what's hypertension? High blood pressure, I guess. High blood pressure. Yes. Uh, so the mother is going to have some hypertension and proteuria. So what do you mean by proteuria? Protein, exactly, uh, pro uh, prote uh, proteuria, protein basically you're going to have excess protein in the urine, okay? So this is some characteristic of the preeclampsia and it's very, and it's very dangerous complication in pregnant, in uh, pregnant women. So whenever they found uh, that, uh, that the, the woman uh, is going to have some preeclampsia, they, they have to, uh, and usually they discover by the uh, week 20, so uh, they need to act because it can affect the baby. So whenever this preeclampsia gets more complicated and seizures may be involved, we call it what? We change the name from preeclampsia, we change it to eclampsia. So preeclampsia is mostly with hypertension and proteuria. Whenever preeclampsia get, gets complicated and seizures are gonna start being involved, we call it eclampsia, okay? 
Did you guys understand this? Yes. Can you explain the proteinuria? Okay, proteinuria. Basically, we, in our body, in our blood, what do we have? We have mix of things. We have uh, proteins in our blood too. Okay. So if there if there was excess removal of protein in this, um, uh, in, is, if there was excess removal of the protein uh, uh, in the urine, it's going to cause us some problem. That's that means the protein in our body is going to get less. So the, ur the urine is going to have high protein from our body and our body is going to get less protein, okay? So that it can cause a lot of problems. You do not really need to know, but just remember hypertension and proteinuria. Proteinuria is basically high protein in the urine, okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, so and just you need to remember, I have seen this, it was mentioned. Um, uh, basically, what do you mean? Uh, protein urine can cause uh, hypertension. It can lead to many complications and uh, it can lead to edema. What is edema? It's basically swelling. Okay. Whenever you like, for example, you get uh, injured or something, you get like a swelling. Okay. This is called edema. So protein urea can cause it, uh, can be one of uh, the things that cause edema. Okay. For the last, uh, for the last homeostatic imbalance, I want you guys to focus on, um, now, whenever whenever the baby is is uh, being delivered, a normal delivery, let's say a normal delivery, where from where does the baby pass? From the vaginal canal, صح ولا لا? So whenever the pelvis the pelvis isn't uh, isn't conditioned enough, isn't uh, isn't big enough, isn't flexible enough, uh, some 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 conditions that can affect the delivery of the baby so what you, doctors usually do so they don't do the uh, normal delivery they do something we call it a uh, cesarean section basically where they open uh, the uterine cavity and take the baby out instead of moving the baby from the uh, uh the other uh, the vaginal canal a normal delivery basically um and it is called the uh, dysphria okay so did you guys um Get what do you mean by uh, and obviously uh, this specific uh, this specific part is going to be explained in the stages of labor more. I just wanted to uh, just explain uh, what would happen if the pelvic wasn't flexible enough and what usually doctors do when the pelvis is not flexible. So did you guys uh, get uh, what uh, the this part? Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So. I guess now we're done with the homeostatic imbalances. Now for the lactation. Okay, I just have one part left and we're gonna go to stages. Uh, okay, so for the stages of labor, I guess we don't have time uh, because now I guess M27 is closing, but so for, for the stages of labor, if you have any question, you can just ask me or ask uh, Rafa. Uh, on private, like if you like, try to read it. It's not very hard, Sarah. يعني. But if you feel that there is any uh, any complication, we'll try to do a video uh, just to compensate because we don't have time to explain the stages of labor. I'm just gonna be explaining this last part. It's very very important because 100% you guys are gonna be asked about it for the lactation. How does lactation, breastfeeding, how does it start? It's very important because like 100% questions are gonna come from it. First of all, the baby, first of all, we need to, a stimulus. For a stimulus to start, uh, for this, the whole process we start, we need a stimulus. So the baby, as you can see here, the baby is, uh, will, first of all, to start all the process, the baby will start suckling on the nipple, okay? The suckling on the nipple is going to, is going to start many processes, okay? First, uh, first of all, this stimulation is gonna be sent to the hypothalamus. I'll just try to draw so we can, guys, like better visualize what I'm trying to say. Just a second. Okay. So first of all, as you can see here, suckling. Okay, suckling stimulates everything. So the suckling is going to send some uh, some stimulus to the hypothalamus. As you can see here, let's imagine this is the hypothalamus. The uh, the hypothalamus. What would the hypothalamus do? First of all, it's going to release something we call it the prolactin releasing factor. Okay, so this prolactin releasing factor is going to go from the hypothalamus and it's going to go to the. This is uh, I'm just pr uh, drawing like the uh, pituitary gland. As you can see, this is the pituitary gland, by the way. 
it looks like this and it's stuck to the hypothalamus, okay? The, first of all, suckering is going to send some stimulus to the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus is going to, to release a, 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 a hormone, we call it the prolactin releasing factor. And it's going to, I need to just remember this, it's going, this prolactin releasing factor is going to play on the anterior pituitary. On the anterior, we have, pituitary gland has two main things, anterior and posterior pituitary gland. So the prolactin releasing factor is going to go to the anterior pituitary gland and tell the anterior pituitary gland to start secreting prolactin. So we need prolactin. What's the function of prolactin? The prolactin is going to go to the breast, obviously, uh, to the mammary gland of the breast. What's the function of prolactin? Prolactin main function is to uh, is to produce the milk. Okay, the milk is produced. Okay, prolactin function is what to produce the milk. The milk if, is produced, but but the milk is not ejected. صح ولا لا؟ it just produced in the breast, but it's not ejected. So what's going to happen for the ejection of the milk? We need another hormone. We call it exocytosine. Okay, now let's go back to the suckling. Okay, the suckling is also going to send uh, uh, a stimulus to the hypothalamus again, as I said. But now the stimulus is going to go to the pituitary, as to the to the pituitary, to the pituitary, pituitary uh, to the to the posterior pituitary gland. Okay, from the posterior pituitary gland, there is going to be a hormone that's going to be stored in the posterior pituitary gland. We call it the exocytosine. Again, same, same, uh, same, uh, same story. The oxytocin is going to go to the breast, and it's going to stimulate the myoepithelial cells of the breast to start contracting. And once the cells of the uh, myoepithelial cells of the breast they start contracting, the ejaculation of the milk is going to happen. And as you guys meant, uh, as you guys uh, have uh, studied before, we have a positive feedback. So the more the stimulus, the more the letdown reflex, the more the ejaculation of the milk. This is the one of the most important positive feedbacks that is going to be repeated in many years. Uh, this is a positive feedback where basically the more the suckling, the more the what? The more the oxytocin is going to be produced, the more let down of milk. Did you guys understand uh, uh, the uh, the lactation process? Should I repeat? Hmm? No, it's clear. Someone has a question? Yeah, you can ask. Someone has a question? You can you can open your mic and ask me. Okay. So this is basically for the lactation process. And as you can see here uh, in your book, some advantages or advantages of breast milk, why breast milk is very important. Um, uh, they have been mentioned in your book. I'm not gonna go over them, but like you can just read them through. But I really guys like this, uh, this mind map is very important because uh, questions are gonna come from it 100%, okay? So that's it for our session. For the stages of labor, we're going to try to make a video or something so we can compensate because we really don't have time and M27 is already closing. So, um, and yeah, we're, we're basically being kicked out. So do you, if you have any question, anything, anything you didn't understand, you feel that I was fast, you can always refer back to the recording, which I'm going to be posting very soon. And uh, other thing, you, can, you have my WhatsApp number. You can ask me any question. Uh, I'm gladly, happily, I'm going to be ask, uh, answering any of the questions you guys are going to be asking. So uh, I'm going to be stopping the recording now.